Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast. This edition of the Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by these great sponsors. Axon started out of a passion for keeping agriculture moving. Imagine having 100 years of tire and wheel knowledge in your back pocket the next time you sell a piece of ag equipment. To find more or become an Axon dealer, please visit axontire.com. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800 800- 657-4910 for all your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. No matter how you buy your ag equipment, whether it's from a dealer, an auction, or a private party, Ag Direct can help you finance it. You can even apply online at agdirect.com. Learn more about your financing options at agdirect.com. TractorZoom has access to over $20 billion in heavy equipment sales data. TractorZoom's Iron Comps is the industry's trusted solution for transparent equipment values and auctionable pricing insights. This podcast is brought to you by Anvil AppWorks. The Dealer Connect CRMI app with integrated inventory management is an affordable Salesforce-based solution for your dealership. Create connected customer experience and transform how you work. Moving higher in the 21st century. Hard-working people working hard for you and me Moving higher time and time again Through the years you'll find us here Moving higher Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast. Marcus with Sean Hackett. This edition of the Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by Axon Tire, helping dealers move more iron for the past 100 years. For more information, go to axontire.com. Axon's got a couple great offers for the loyal listeners of the Moving Iron Podcast. If you want a free baseball cap, send an email to marketing at axontire.com and they'll send that over to you. And if you want to get $50 off of your registration for the Moving Iron Summit coming up, the good people over at Axon are going to throw that in the mix. So check that out at Moving Iron Podcast, Moving Iron Podcast.com, and I will get you signed up on the list. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for 33 years. Call Parker at 800 657 4910 for your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. And no matter how you buy your ag equipment, whether it's from a dealer, an auction, or a private party, Ag Direct can help you finance it. You can even apply online to agdirect.com. Learn more about your financing options at agdirect.com. TractorZoom has access to over $20 billion in heavy equipment sales data. TractorZoom's Iron Comps is the industry's trusted solution for transparent equipment values and auctionable pricing insights. Finally, this podcast is brought to you by Anvil AppWorks. Their Dealer Connect CRMI app with integrated inventory management is an affordable Salesforce-based solution for your dealership. Create a connected customer experience and transform how you work today. Sean Hackett is with Hackett Financial out of Boca Raton, Florida, and he's nice enough to come on and talk about what's happening in the marketplace. So, Sean, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing pretty good. Doing pretty good. Is there a lot of snow drifts down there in Florida this morning? Um, yes, on my screen there is. Is there? Yes. Okay, good. good yeah, good. I've, I've seen a whole bunch of snow drifts on my screen. Yeah. There's a, you weren't kidding about a cold front coming through. It's uh, it's cold <laughs> and snowy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's 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 a real real time winter time right now for sure. Yep. It's serious. Uh, it's been a while since we've had a December like you know. Yeah, we've had a lot of Januarys and Februarys and Marches, but uh, uh, December's for whatever reason have been on a little bit on the more mild side, and this one's delivering uh, a good, pretty good punch. Yeah. So, sounds you know, like the same story that went the same storm that went through my area is making its way east to have a uh, a uh, nor'easterish type of effect up there. I had did a recorder with Rich Posson yesterday and he was talking about five to 10 inches up there in, in the part of New York that he's in. So yeah, you know, they're going to get some snow fall in the Northeast and uh, where I'm going in West Virginia, we're supposed to get a foot of snow there. Uh, so, you know, definitely uh, a, a, a wide ranging weather pattern right now. So, so when you go to West Virginia and you're going to get a foot of snow, don't, don't wear your flip flops. You want to wear, <laughs> you want to wear like lace up boots. Okay. So, I don't know if they I said. Do, I, I was going to wear my hush peppies instead. So <laughs> there you go. There you go. All right. <laughs> well, a lot the of secret. New- this the secret is out. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of uh, a lot of stuff going on this week or today. Um, you know, we've talked about wheat here last week. We talked about the cold winter kill coming through next week. What that might look like and how it's going to affect the wheat market. You got Argentina uh, cutting their wheat. Um, crop estimates again um every every time they put a report out they cut that it seems like um and then you're looking at 
the EU, they're starting to see some um, bigger crops on the horizon than what they thought they were going to have last year. So I guess let's start with that first, Sean, looking at the wheat market, what you see happening there. Are you, are you still in the same camp that you were uh, when we talked last time? <clears throat> yep, we have a major winter kill event next week in the U.S. I think we're going to get one in Russia, Ukraine at the turn of the year. Um, and then we may have more after that. Like I said, we're going to have a pretty potent short cold winter. So, um, that's on the table. I don't think the current complacency towards geopolitics for weed is sustainable. I think we're going to ratchet it up again as we get into January. And when I even look at this, at the exports coming out of Russia, despite the fact they have large supplies, they're not able to get it out, uh, do their infrastructure issues. So. You know, then, like I said, you look at uh, all the um, you know tightness in the market, and I just think that we're mispriced here, Casey. This, you know, as I said to you last time, I you know fourteen dollars was probably clearly overshooting it mm-hmm. to the top side, but I also think you know low to mid sevens here on Chicago uh, wheat here SRW is just too low, and we need to recalibrate higher uh, to better reflect the true fundamentals and, and the risk to production is still going forward. Remember everything's in dormancy and we, you know, with the, there still could be tremendous fireworks once we come out of dormancy, depending on how weather plays out in the different regions. So with all that on the table, I just think the odds and the probabilities are favoring upside price risks right now. And I would, if I was a buyer, I'm a physical buyer of wheat, you know, I sure would be trying to protect, my three month, four month, five month price outlook, just in case we catch some significant spike trades here on a on a on a combination of weather issues and maybe some escalating geopolitics. I just our smart money algorithm is really positive right now. Our technicals are are turning positive right now. Uh, we just think wheat is not a is is a market one wants to uh, be protecting to the upside. We really feel strongly about that right now. So right on. Okay. All right, let's talk about let's talk about crush uh, soybean crush. Um, not too long ago, they were concerned at all time record low soybean crushes. I don't know if that actually ever happened, but it seems like um, about every three months they put out a new record. Um, they're expecting here in November's crush rate to have been um, uh, an all time record uh, when you're looking at there. So if you look at soybean crush rates, you look at, you know the, the, this this. Uh, thirst for for biodiesel and what that looks like and how that's all playing in the fact what's your thoughts there and how's that how do you think that's affecting what we see happening in the soybean market because here lately there's been a lot of volatility in the soybean market there's been massive you know interday runs um and you'll see it'll finish up 10 15 cents and down 25 cents the next day so a lot of volatility in that marketplace the problem is in the short run we're trying to determine how bad is the Argentine situation relative to how good is the Brazilian situation. Our overall view is the Brazil situation is so good and will stay so good that it'll eventually went out and cause soybeans to sell off. The problem is all these crushing plants are coming online between now and let's say first half of 2024 and the demand for soybeans domestically here in the U S to crush Soybeans for bean oil for renewable diesels just is out of sight. In fact, if you if if every crushing operation that's either being built, going to be built, or is soon to be operating, all you know are are, are you know, finish off what they're doing. You know we need to plant something like a hundred to one hundred ten million acres of soybeans in order to provide the demand or the supply for the demand that would be there for all these new crushing plants. I don't know how we do that. Where do we get, how do we get uh, 20 million more acres of soybeans? Who do we pull that from? I don't you know that that's, that's the big issue is, you know, I'm not sure how that works, but that would seem to me to be a quite a bullish scenario in the back half of 23 into 2024, because those numbers simply do not work. If you're stealing them from corn then corn takes off, you're stealing them from soybean, uh, from wheat, then wheat doesn't work. I mean, if you're stealing them from cotton, then it, it's like there's not enough acres to go around and make this 
soybean, bean oil, renewable diesel thing work. So that's lurking out there in the back half of 23 and 24. And of course, if then we if we then parlay that into some kind of a one in one hundred year Gleisberg cycle drought cycle, you know, you 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 have yourself potentially a, a chaotic market situation. And so I think the market is it no, you know, it's not, I'm not the only one that knows this is happening, Casey. It's just I think everyone has a hard time uh, calibrating that very bullish demand side picture out there later on in the year to what could could potentially be a significant short-term oversupply out of Brazil. And I think that's what's causing this uh, bifurcated indecision in the soybean market uh, overall. So, Okay. That is, uh, I never thought of it like that because that's a, that's a good point. I mean, if you want biodiesel and you want ethanol and all these other things, demand for all that is, I mean, we already have all the acres we can plant anyway. So you, you can't rob Peter to pay Paul because he just throws everything out of whack. I just don't know, you know, I don't know, you know, because it's all but, you know, the government, the uh, inflation reduction bill just poured tons of money at this. Mm -hmm. And I just don't know if they really thought this through, you know, the people building these crushing plants, boy, I sure hope they know what they're doing. You know, I sure hope they get their supplies locked in well in advance before they open because, you know, they, I don't know. I just don't know how this is going to work. It'll be very interesting, but either way, there's going to be tremendous pressure to increase soybean acres. And, um, you know, that will be a, a, an interesting interplay to see how that will work at a time when we don't, you know, where other markets can, you know, may, maybe the corn market can, can give up some if we have big crop this year, but I don't think you give up, you know, 10, 15 million acres without getting into trouble immediately the following year. So something has to give, but I certainly would view any major break here as we've talked about before any major break in the grain markets here into the spring on big brazilian production on early spring better weather coming big potential you know all that bearishness that might come into the grain markets i'd certainly that would be what this this whole renewable diesel push uh and the need for more soybean acres would be was one of the reasons i certainly would want to be a strong cash buyer of these markets, especially from the livestock sector, um, on, on top of the f- fact that I think we're going to be going into a historic drought period in 24, 25. So uh, for now, you know, I'm still feeling the bear side has the, has the, um, you know, has the advantage, but, uh, but not for very long. So. All right. Let's talk over a little bit over the uh, protein markets here, what you see happening there. Cattle market <clears throat> still bouncing around all over the place. Um, we're seeing some higher numbers out there, but like you've indicated, you feel like going into the first quarter, first and second quarter of 23, start seeing a few of those, uh, um, numbers start to slip a little bit. So give me your thoughts on the cattle market right now. I really haven't changed my view and I'm not going to change my view. Um, I'm worried about a major air pocket in the demand for meat protein overall, you know, whether it's pork, chicken, or beef, I think the first quarter is going to be very ugly. On the demand side, and even though we know the animals in are low, um, I, I don't think they're going to be low enough to offset that. I think we need to get into the second quarter onward to where the animals that are available to come to the market, the herd rebuilding cycle that would that are, that will be kicking in, will be extreme enough that it'll override. And I think that you know if we have trough demand in the first quarter, demand will start to improve. So I really think prices need to go down end of the first quarter, I'm suggesting that livestock producers button up their price protection on their heads of cattle that need to come to the market through the first quarter. Um, but I certainly would feel that the back half of 23, I want to keep my top side open in livestock. I think the upside, think of it this through China's going through a chaotic reopening. They just decided all of a sudden overnight out of the blue, that just all restrictions are gone without having any medications or vaccines or anything. They just, throwing caution to the wind and letting it rip. Now I'm not, we know as fast as M- Omicron type of virus spreads, this will be over very quickly for them. It'll be ugly. It'll be chaotic, but it'll be, over, it'll be over very quickly for them. And by the time you get to the springtime, they'll, they'll, a lot of enough people will have the herd immunity, enough pills and vaccines will be in place. And then they're going to rip. 
China's going to rip to the upside. They're back into now that Z is president for life or whatever you want to call him for life. Uh, they're back to you know, juicing this economy because without a strong economy, they can't be the superpower they want to be. So from second quarter armor, Chinese demand is going to start to rip aggressively, I think. And that means the demand for meat proteins is going to rip at a time that there's no animals. <laughs> so you could see that you know, we have a pretty exciting situation setting up for the back half of the year. But in the short run, that's 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 out there. That's not the next three or four months. And so I'm worried about a, a knockdown, a pretty good knockdown here in the livestock sector. So, um, you know, be careful about the short term, make sure you, you manage your risks, but, um, you know, be excited about the long-term picture here. Right on. Okay. When you're looking at, um, and I'm, I'm going to talk about this just because of what's going on in my neck of the woods here. So we've got, uh, sugar beet harvest came through and the, uh, I think it's pretty well safe to say that everywhere that grew sugar beets, it was not uh, the biggest crop on the planet. And if you look at sugar production right now, the the uh, the tons weren't there, and um, oddly enough, the sugar wasn't there as as they thought it would be um, on our sugar beet um, harvest. So, when you look at the sugar market right now, Sean, what are your thoughts there, and, and what are some of your insights? This issue for me is that you know Europe had a disaster. You know, they had that terrible drought and they really rely on sugar beet production for sugar for them, for the local, you know, for their domestic demand. And it's a disaster. I mean, if look, the numbers come out of France are complete disaster. So there's a major shortage of sugar in Europe. Um, as you said, you know, we're not, we're not, uh, we're not seeing snow drifts of sugar here either. Um, and if we're heading into a, a, a Nino year, that means hot, dry for India, hot, dry for Thailand, hot, dry for areas that they grow a lot of sugar. So the prospect here for sure looks pretty good to me um, in terms of having you know a pretty tight supply environment and um, and a weather pattern that should be you know pretty um, pretty negative here once we get into the spring onward when we get into the next growing season in Asia. Uh, it, it should support negative production prospects, and so. Sugar has gone sideways now for almost two years, you know, kind of been trained between like say 18 cents or 20 cents here back and forth. It hasn't done a whole lot, but you know, the, the bigger, the base, the bigger, the move when it breaks out, I'm thinking we, you know, the first half of 23 could be uh, a period when the sugar market breaks out of this long base and maybe starts to express this tightness, especially if we get some weather issues coming in from an lineal pattern kicking in. Um, you know, that, that, that to me is, you know, is, is a market that uh, has been a sleeper, but might wake up and outperform here in 23 versus other markets that may, uh, you know, that may not be very exciting. So. Right on. Okay. Well, good stuff as usual. Good stuff as usual, Sean. Wow. It really came out well. If folks <laughs> reach out to you and get more information about what it is you're doing over to Hackett Financial, what's the best way to do that? Our website is Hackett, H-A-C-K-E-T-T, advisors.com. As always, lots of information on there that goes over what we do and how we do it uh, to see if this way we do things with our weather algorithm and our capital flows um, you know, might be of value to those in agriculture that listen to your show. Absolutely awesome. Thanks for being on the podcast, man. Thanks, Casey. Really appreciate it. All right. I'm Casey Seymour with Moving Iron Podcast. Check me out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Moving Iron LLC. Go to LinkedIn at Moving Iron Podcast. Check out check out the YouTube version of this, the video version of this at the Moving Iron Podcast YouTube channel, which is the Moving Iron Podcast YouTube channel. So check that out. Everything Moving Iron related, go to movingironllc.com and you get all the information for anything you want right there. So with that, I'm Casey Seymour. Wish on Hackett. It's going to be smart, folks. Out. Axon started out of a passion for keeping agriculture moving. Imagine having 100 years of tire and wheel knowledge in your back pocket the next time you sell a piece of ag equipment. To find more or become an Axon dealer, please visit axontire.com. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 for all your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. No matter how you buy your ag equipment, whether it's from a dealer, an auction, or a private party, Ag Direct can help you finance it. You can even apply online at agdirect.com. Learn more about your financing options at agdirect.com. 
TractorZoom has access to over $20 billion in heavy equipment sales data. TractorZoom's IronComps is the industry's trusted solution for transparent equipment values and auctionable pricing insights. This podcast is brought to you by Anvil AppWorks. The Dealer Connect CRMI app with integrated inventory management is an affordable Salesforce-based solution for your dealership. Create connected customer experience and transform how you work. Moving higher in the 21st century. Hardware. 